And then now we've got a um, 25-year-old woman with a skin cyst. And see how I put the, air, the quotes around cyst? Um, it's a real soapbox issue for me. So a cyst on the breast, present for many years, but slowly enlarging, okay? The reason I, I like to do this all, when I use unknowns, because I can't tell you how many things get sent into me surgically excised um, as, you know, rule out cyst, and they end up being all manner of unusual spindle cell tumors or adnexal tumors, both benign and malignant. So I always like to tell my residents and fellows, everything is a cyst until it's not a cyst, okay? And that's because any nodule that you get that's in the deep dermis or subcutis, doesn't matter what kind of cells are making up that nodule, it's gonna look like a skin-colored bump, a skin-colored nodule, which 99% of the time will be a cyst or a lipoma. So it's not surprising that all sorts of different things that are rare can get misdiagnosed clinically as cyst or lipoma, but I think it's important, and I always point it out to, to trainees, especially uh, med students who will go into you know, primary care specialties or general surgery to let them know that don't just tell patients that every bump that they've got, oh, it's just a cyst. Probably it will be, but you never can tell until you, you know, examine it pathologically, uh, which is why we have jobs. So uh, I do point that out because I've met many patients with uh, tumors that were misdiagnosed for a long time as cysts until they were finally biopsied and found to be something else. So here we go. So we can't really, the epidermis is up here. And the tumor fills the dermis. Actually, let me go back to low power. Fills the dermis. And here's where the dermis ends and the subcutis begins. And it extends way deep into the subcutis. It looks like it has a really circumscribed, smooth border, doesn't it? And I remember that really confused me the first time I saw one of these. But the key is this. Not always what it's doing at the periphery. What's it doing in the middle? Right here. The spindle cells are very bland, elongated cells. They look like fibroblasts or even almost like neural cells. Looks kind of like a neural tumor, almost like a neurofibroma or some benign fibroblastic thing. Very bland, no atypia, no pleomorphism. But this entrapment of adipocytes that are kind of crunched into the middle here. So does anyone know what this is going to be? It's a tumor that's very near and dear to my heart because um, I... Uh, like Dr. Wolf mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I volunteer in a variety of um, rare cancer patient support groups. And uh, one of the first ones, the first one actually that I joined and really got involved actively in was for this tumor. And so this is dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, DFSP, all right? And um, it's an important tumor because it's, even though it's you know, all sarcomas are rare, but as sarcomas go, this is more common than some of them. I see these relatively regularly. They often get misdiagnosed clinically as cyst, lipoma, scar. Uh, they can sometimes be flat clinically and not um, a protu protu uh, protuberant from the skin. And so those flat non-protuberans kind of form of DFSP are often misdiagnosed clinically. We actually did a survey study that was, uh, we had patients from the group that suggested this idea and five of them uh, became co-authors with us, helped us design the study. And then we surveyed the members of the group to see how their tumor presented and how long the delay was for diagnosis. Um, I'll put a link to that paper in here if you're, uh, if you're interested uh, to read it. So they, um, they are important to know because they are very bland, okay? A lot of times people um, who have not seen a DFSP before have the idea in mind that it's a sarcoma. It should have, you know, pleomorphism and be ugly and look kind of like that AFX I showed you earlier. DFSPs are translocation-driven sarcomas, right? And as a general rule, sarcomas or any tumor really that is driven by a balanced gene fusion, balanced translocations, usually have monotonous uniform tumor cells, not pleomorphism. Now, there are some exceptions, but as a general rule, this works really, really well. Uh, one of my mentors in, in soft tissue fellowship, uh, Mark Edgar, taught me this, and it's been a beautiful pearl because the tumor cells all have the same molecular abnormality, right? Pleomorphism is often a sign of aneuploidy, random chromosomal gains and losses due to chromosomal instability. But gene fusions are a very different way that tumors develop, right? For some reason, two genes break and then refuse together, and that new chimeric gene product drives growth of the tumor. And so those tumors, and think about it. Think about synovial sarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, DFSP, 
and on and on and on, they all have uniform cells. Now you can get necrosis in mitoses and Ewing's or in synovial, but you don't usually get pleomorphism. If I see pleomorphism, that's a strong argument against synovial sarcoma or against Ewing sarcoma or DFSP, all right? So um, the thing is, is that DFSP, as you may remember, it tends to be infiltrative, which is why even though the, the metastatic potential is very low, probably below 2%, you know, it's very rare to get distant mets in a regular DFSP, but they do have a, a significant tendency for local recurrence and they can sometimes recur again and again and again. So that's because they're infiltrative. So if you think, well, it's infiltrative shouldn't have a smooth border, right? But as I, when I saw one of these in fellowship and I asked Dr. Weiss about that, because I was like, well, how can it be so smooth at the, as if it's a DFSP? And she pointed out, and you can see real nicely here, it's smooth because it grew down and eventually kind of hit the fascia or something and kind of flattened out. But all of this here used to be subcutis fat, and it's all been infiltrated and almost completely replaced by tumor. And all you can see are some little stranded islands of compressed adipocytes stranded in the middle. And this is what gives that honeycomb appearance, right? That people talk about the tumor cells infiltrating the fat produces this honeycomb uh, appearance that we see right here. Sometimes you don't even see that. All you'll see is this little cluster of spindle cells here and there. I'm sorry, a little cluster of adipocytes stranded here and there in the middle of the tumor. And the tumor cells are bland, like I said. Um, they may have some occasional mitoses, but usually you're not going to see a ton of mitotic activity. And then look at the growth. Let me get it there. The growth pattern classically is this whirling, swirling story form growth pattern. You can describe story form a hundred different ways, but really you just have to see it. And that's what it looks like right here. This swirled world kind of pattern of spindle cells. Uh, that's the pattern that you typically see in DFSP, although not always. I've seen ones that kind of uh, just had like some sheet-like area or like kind of a little bit of fascicles and weren't as perfectly story form. The other thing is that DFSP can have a range of cellularity. It can go from kind of being very hypocellular and having a lot of collagen in the background to areas that are more cellular. Now, when you start seeing transition into areas that are more diffusely cellular like this, if you see a lot of cellularity and a lot of more fascicular growth and kind of almost that herringbone pattern of acute angle intersecting fascicles, then you can consider that maybe it's undergoing higher grade transformation into fibrosarcomatous DFSP. And those do have a somewhat higher risk of distant metastases. Uh, most studies say around 15%. Still, I would say that you know the majority of patients do well with wide local excision or MOS. So I think probably I was at the time I saw this case, this is not a slam dunk fibrosarcomatous DFSP, but I suspected that this area maybe was starting to transition into fibrosarcomatous. The treatment is going to be the same, just the difference is in prognosis, okay? So do keep an eye out that when you start getting increased cellularity and um, more uh, kind of herringbone fascicles, that maybe that is uh, turning into fibrosarcomatous. And then the immunostain um, that you'll see here is diffuse CD34 expression, strong diffuse wall-to-wall -wall expression. Sometimes the more cellular fibrosarcomatous areas can lose expression paradoxically of CD34. It doesn't have to, but it, it does sometimes. Also, I will point out that dilated kind of branching pattern of vessels, kind of similar to the vessels you see in, say, solitary fibrous tumor, I often see those in DFSP, particularly the more cellular uh, fibrosarcomatous ones. So I think there's some area in here. Yeah, like in here, there's more branching vessels. See, kind of SFT shaped uh, vessels. So just to point that out, that that vascular pattern is not at all specific for solitary fibrous tumor, can be seen in a variety of other things. Okay, so, oh, and then the, the translocation here is the most common translocation is collagen 1A1 PDGFB, okay, B as in boy. And uh, that's the translocation that has been known for a long time and, uh, the vast majority, over 90%, I think, of, um, I can't remember the exact number, but the vast majority of DFSP are positive for that gene rearrangement. But recently, in the past few years, there's been a discovery of an alternative gene fusion involving PDGFD, D as in Delta, and, um, and a couple different fusion partners. And I've actually now seen um, uh, one case myself and partnered with a colleague, Dr. Julia Bridge. Uh, she had a case of it. We're actually working on... Um, I think it's uh, been, we submitted it, we're waiting to hear back. So, so we've only been a handful of those cases reported so far, but just so you know that that is a possibility to have an alternative fusion. Now, would I do a fish to prove the diagnosis here? No. To me, this is like diagnostic really on H&E. I probably would do the CD34. Actually, I don't know if I would. I would probably just sign this out as, 
as DFSP. I can't remember if I did the stain in this case or not, actually. This is just, just classic. I don't think there's anything else this could feasibly be um, in this case. But in cases where I have a partial biopsy and I can't see how the tumor interfaces with the fat or the morphology is not classic, those are times where I may send off for the fish. Um, uh, I do the fish uh, sometimes when I'm pretty sure it's DFSP, but I can't see the fat trapping and I'm not 100% certain because if I call it DFSP, they're going to do a big excision with, uh, with a, a, you know, a broad, wide margins. And the scars, uh, the scars and surgical defects from these can be very morbid to the patients and very disfiguring, especially if they occur in the genital region or on the face or scalp, which are common sites for this tumor. These are classically described on the trunk, but, but a significant subset occur on the head and neck or in the anogenital region, which are much more problematic sites as far as management goes, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, so in cases like that, I will do the fish. Or if I have a bland CD34 positive spindle cell thing that doesn't really look like DFSP, but it's just a small biopsy, and I'm pretty sure it's not, but I want to be totally sure, that's when I'll send fish also. Where I'm going to say, I don't know what this is, but I think it's benign and you can leave it alone, versus it's DFSP, do a big surgery. So those are the times that I, that I go to fish. When it's a classic case, I personally don't feel like fish is needed. I just wanted to put this extra slide in to show you a different, a different area of how the... Um, of how the um, the uh, fat entrapment can look. So someone asked, could a myofibroblastoma enter the differential here? Um, maybe, I think myofibroblastoma would also known as mammary type myofibroblastoma. Those are tumors that are were first described in the breast of older men, but now we recognize can occur at a variety of sites and they have a lot of overlap with spindle cell lipoma and probably are on a, on a spectrum with them. And yeah, I suppose it could. I feel like in uh, my mammary myofibroblastoma, you usually get really prominent palisading of the spindle cells, kind of with the zigzagging arrangement. And I have a few really nice examples of that uh, with digital slides. If you go and look on that uh, bone and soft tissue uh, directory page here on Kiko, you can search for myofibroblastoma and I have some really classic examples. So they do look a bit different, but yeah, there are times, I've seen times where, um, where spindle cell lipomas uh, got misdiagnosed as DFSP because they both are CD34 positive. They both have bland spindle cells. They both have fat. Right, so there are some times where those can look alike. So I suppose because myofibroblastoma is on that spectrum, that yeah, that could kind of enter the differential. The other thing that can look kind of like this and have bland spindle cells with kind of a swirling, whirling growth is perineurioma. So if I didn't have any fat trapping and I saw swirling and whirling, I definitely could think of perineurioma, and they can have um, uh, some overlap in the immunohistochemistry with DFSP. I have a full video on about perineuriomas. I like it's like 40 minutes long. It shows multiple examples. So if you want to check that out, you can. And then um, there was one other thing I was going to tell you. Oh yeah, of course, diffuse neurofibroma. That is, I think, the most important differential here to consider. Because when you get a really bland hypocellular uh, DFSP, bland spindle cells that look kind of neural and in, 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 uh, in fat and trapped within it, that's exactly how a diffuse type neurofibroma can grow. And I have seen examples that looked very similar of diffuse neurofibroma that looked very similar to DFSP because of the prominent um, infil infiltration or entrapment of adipose tissue. And something that a lot of people uh, are not very familiar with is that Neurofibromas are usually CD34 positive. There's a background dendritic cell network in the background of neurofibromas that stain with CD34. So the majority of neurofibromas are going to have a lot of CD34 expression. So if you're having a bad day, you could see a diffuse neurofibroma, see fat entrapment, do a CD34, and misdiagnose it as DFSP, and that patient gets an enormous excision that they don't need. So the, my advice there is if you have any doubt whatsoever between neurofibroma and DFSP do S100 or SOX10 in addition to CD34. And if your S100 and SOX10 is positive, uh, strongly positive, then that is going to be your neurofibroma. I used to say you will never see S100 expression in a DFSP, but the problem with saying never in medicine is that we will always eventually get proven wrong if we wait long enough. And I have now seen one example, only once, of a fibrosarcomatous DFSP that had patchy but very real S100 expression um, in it. And uh, I, I, when I get around to it, we might actually write that up because uh, to my knowledge, I've never seen that before. So I was totally shocked. But it had a lot of other features that were clearly obvious DFSP. And, um, and we did confirm it with molecular too, just to make sure. All right. So that's DFSP. And again, like I said, a near and dear tumor to my heart because I've worked a lot with these patients and getting to co-author a paper 
It was actually the 100th paper that I ever published um, with five DFSP patients, not as like research subjects, but actual co-authors who took the city ethics training, who were on the IRB protocol, who helped us design the study and shared the authorship line with me. I think it's probably the most um, the most meaningful thing I ever published, and I, I love that it was my 100th paper because it was like a significant landmark. And to be able to to be co-authors and partners with those patients who were who really desperately wanted to be co-researchers to participate in the process, ooh, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. it. Really, really did change my life working with these groups. And you can check out that TED talk if you want. And uh, it's really been an amazing experience for me. And I, I think honestly, for rare diseases, that's the way forward for rare disease research. Okay.